second reason lies in the uses each country made of our Western civilization. Let's see what China took. You will notice that this is a very old piece of film. Actually, it is more than 30 years old, and it shows a very great man by the name of Sun Yat-sen. In 1911, this man fathered a people's revolution, which brought to an end China's ancient imperial government and began its new era as a modern republic, winning for himself in Chinese history as secure a place as George Washington has in ours. And he and his followers chose for the cornerstone of their new republic Chinese words that echoed those of another believer in democracy. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. And to make these principles become reality, they built more schools and colleges. They established scholarships so that their young men and women could go forth to the universities of America and Europe and bring back to their own country other Western ideas. And this new generation returned to China with new techniques of industry, architecture, science, medicine. They built more hospitals to free their people from the blight of disease. They introduced compulsory education. They laid down as essential two of the four freedoms for which we fight today, freedom of expression and freedom of religion. In 1925, Sun Yat-sen died, but his disciples, led by Chiang Kai-shek, carried on his monumental work. Their aim, the unification and modernization of China. Chinese industry was old-fashioned and inefficient. Transportation was slow and inadequate. But now railroads began to link the great seaports and river harbors with the inland cities. A network of highways began to stretch beyond the railroad line into the deep interior. After leaving them untouched for centuries, China was beginning to use her vast store of raw materials. And soon the tools and machines of the new factories were delivering the goods and products for China's new economy. For the Chinese believed in using the best of Western civilization for the progress of their country. And while they were building this new nation, just a day and a half by steamer across the Yellow Sea lay Japan. Here, the god emperor and his fanatic warlords were using this same Western civilization for one purpose and only one, to create one of the world's most powerful war machines. Their aim, the absorption of China and the fulfillment of the Tanaka Memorial. For years, Japan had deliberately copied military weapons and industrial techniques discovered in other countries. For years, Japan, under the pretext of lacking raw materials for industry, had been buying in every corner of the world materials not only to build this war machine, but materials which could be stored to feed it in the war of conquest they were planning. For years, while other nations were trying to outlaw war by reducing armaments, Japan was feverishly and secretly building a modern army, a modern navy, a modern air force to strike its infamous blow at the civilized world. And we all now know about the islands in the Pacific that Japan fortified in violation of all international treaties. These were the reasons why it was possible for Japan, only one twentieth the size of China, and only one sixth the population of China, to think of conquering China as the first step to world conquest. And as you have seen, in 1931 they embarked on phase one, the occupation of Manchuria. The small bonfire that the Japanese lit in Manchuria was to grow and spread with uncontrollable fury until the entire world was aflame. Phase one of the Tanaka plan was completed and exactly as planned. 
The Japs have been confident that this first and sudden land grab could be accomplished without their becoming involved in a major war. And they were right. The unification of China was still too remote for the Chinese of the South to care what happened to their kinsmen in the North. Using the step-by-step -step technique, a few months later, the Japs took a crack at Shanghai. The Chinese resistance was so great, they hastily called that deal off, waited another year, and then struck in the north again, carving the province of Yehol out of China proper. This, too, they got away with. The world criticized, the Chinese protested, but still, the Japs got what they wanted, another piece of China, and without a war on their hands. And to rule over Manchuria and Yeho, the Japs then set up a puppet government under their stooge, Henry Puyi, the Chinese quizzling prince. But the leaders of New China remembered that in other centuries, other barbarians had invaded their country. The evidence still stood in the Great Wall, built by their ancestors more than 2,000 years earlier and stretching for 1,400 miles across mountain and desert to protect themselves from the barbarians of the north. Of the Great Wall, it has been said that it is the only work of man which would be visible from the moon. But the Chinese knew that modern barbarians can't be stopped by a wall, however strong or high. They can't even be stopped by people, unless the people are united. And by 1937, the unification of China was making such progress, the Japs got worried. The one weapon they could not permit China was unity. They would strike again before China could become a nation. This time, it'd be a big bite five more northern provinces out of the heart of China. At the United States Embassy in China as military attaché for a number of years was Colonel William Mayer. Let him tell you what happened. The first thing the Japs did was to prepare their usual fake alibi. This time it wasn't a damaged railway track as it had been in Manchuria in 1931. A Jap soldier had disappeared. Obviously he'd been kidnapped by the insolent Chinese. Once more Japan's honor had been insulted once more, the insult must be avenged. So, on the night of July 7th, 1937, at the Marco Polo Bridge near Peking, the Jap war machine struck. Within the space of a few weeks, the invaders were in control of Tinsin and Beiping. It looked as if the Japs were going to have another walkover. Now the Japs sat back to digest and organize this new conquest. The peace-loving Japanese didn't want a war if they could get their land grabs without one. But this time they were in for a rude surprise. This time, instead of protesting or negotiating, the Chinese struck back. And not in the north but at Shanghai, where the Japs least expected. 